This video was brought to you by Nebula. Over the weekend, Iran fired hundreds of drones and missiles at Israel, marking a serious escalation in the long-running shadow war between the two states. While only a handful of missiles actually reached their targets, and both Iran and the US have since signaled that they don't want any further escalation, at the time of writing, Israel is yet to decide on its response, and the risk of a war in the Middle East is perhaps the greatest it's been since October 7th. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what happened over the weekend, Israel's strategic calculus going forwards, and whether we're really another step closer to World War III. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start with a quick recap. On April 1st, Israel apparently carried out an airstrike against a consular building next to the Iranian embassy in the Syrian capital of Damascus. This strike killed seven Iranian military advisors, including a top commander for Iran's elite Quds force. Now, his death is perhaps the most high-profile targeted killing of an Iranian since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani by the US in 2020. Now, obviously, this assassination represented a significant escalation in the ongoing shadow war between Israel and Iran, not least because embassies and other diplomatic premises are generally considered to be off-limits. Now, there is a plausible national security rationale for this escalation from Israel's perspective, given Iran is the main backer of both Hamas and Hezbollah, and the Israeli security establishment is understandably anxious about these threats in the aftermath of October 7th. However, it's also worth noting that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had, and still has, a political incentive to escalate against Iran both because it distracts from his shortcomings in Gaza, where Hamas is still active and over 100 hostages remain undiscovered, and because an escalating war against Iran gives him an excuse to refuse an election anytime soon, which polling suggests he'd probably lose. Anyway, following this attack, Iranian retaliation was pretty much inevitable, and on Saturday, after two tense weeks, it finally happened. Firstly, troops from Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, otherwise known as the IRGC, intercepted and boarded a tanker transiting through the Gulf of Amman, which was indirectly owned by an Israeli billionaire. Now, the strategic thinking behind this decision isn't entirely clear to us, but it could be Iran demonstrating their willingness to intercept maritime traffic passing through the Strait of Hormuz. And that's important, because disruption to the Strait of Hormuz, coming on top of the Houthi-related disruption around the Red Sea, would put global shipping under real strain and push up prices, especially oil prices, even higher. But that's not where this ended, because the main Iranian response came a few hours later, when Iran fired hundreds of drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles against a range of targets across Israel. Now, because drones, for instance, take about six hours to travel from Iran to Israel, this meant that there was a slightly surreal few hours when everyone was just waiting for these strikes to arrive. And when they did arrive, the results were slightly underwhelming, at least from Iran's perspective. That's because all of the drones and cruise missiles were shot down by either US fighter jets or Israeli, Saudi, or Jordanian air defense systems, and only a handful of ballistic missiles actually got through, causing some damage to the Nevatim airbase in the Negev desert in southern Israel. In fact, there were no casualties, apart from a seven-year-old Bedouin girl who was hit by shrapnel from an intercepted ballistic missile. Now, the fact that both Saudi Arabia and Jordan cooperated with Israel in defending against the strikes is pretty remarkable, and suggests that, whatever concerns they might have about the way that Israel is prosecuting the war in Gaza, they'd still prefer to support Israel than Iran. Anyway, even if most of the missiles were shot down and actual damage was pretty limited, this is still the first time that we've seen direct fire from Iranian to Israeli territory. And this clearly marks an escalation in the long-running shadow war between Iran and Israel. So with this shadow war warming up, what happens next? Are we about to tip into World War III? Well, it depends. And that's because there are basically two ways of reading this. The first is that Iran just wants war, 
And this is just another step on the escalation ladder. In this case, regional war looks relatively likely, and it's time to get in your bunkers. However, the second way of reading this, and the apparent consensus among well-versed analysts, is that Iran doesn't actually want war, and is escalating in order to de-escalate. In other words, this weekend's strikes were a show of strength to discourage Israelis from trying anything again, and to pacify the more hawkish elements of the Iranian public and political class but were deliberately calibrated to be sufficiently ineffective to avoid triggering an escalatory response from Israel. This would explain why, before the strikes had even landed in Israel, Iran's mission to the UN said that the matter could be deemed concluded, and early on Sunday morning, an Iranian general told Iranian State TV that the operation was, quote, a complete result, and there was no intention to continue, essentially promising no further escalation. In fact, the Israeli government has even refused to deny that they were given explicit forewarning by Iran about the strikes, which is the sort of thing you do if you don't want a full-on war. And this is fundamentally because Iran can't afford a war with Israel. Its economy is in the dumps, and its leadership isn't popular enough to mobilize support for a war that will be catastrophic for both Iran and the wider region. So assuming that this is indeed an escalation to de-escalate, and Iran doesn't want a war, what actually happens next? Well, for anyone who doesn't want further escalation, there's cause for cautious optimism in that the US has already signaled that it doesn't want Israel to escalate further. While he condemned the unprecedented attack, in the immediate aftermath of the strikes, US President Joe Biden also called for a, quote, diplomatic response and said that Netanyahu should treat it as a win, given how little damage was actually done. In the hours since, NBC has even reported that Biden thinks Israel is trying to drag the US into a regional war. And the Times of Israel has reported that Biden somehow prevented Netanyahu from responding to Iran's attack immediately on Saturday night. However, even if Iran and the US are signaling de-escalation, this doesn't mean that a regional war is off the table. The US has proven conspicuously incapable of really influencing Israeli policy, and Netanyahu might decide that a massive missile barrage launched directly at Israel requires some sort of response, even if the actual damage was relatively minimal. Netanyahu does also have an incentive to escalate, not just because it's a good way for him to hold on to power, but also because American, or at least Democrat, support for Israel is steadily waning. So Netanyahu is more likely to enjoy American support the quicker he ascends the escalation ladder against Iran. So it's possible that this isn't all over just yet. Now, actually making this video was pretty difficult. Saturday evening, when the news of the strikes first surfaced, I messaged our writers team to see if anyone would be able to put together a script over the weekend. Kindly, Zach volunteered and wrote this script on Sunday. So on Sunday evening, I headed back to the TLDR studio to do a late night record. Three, two, one. Before I then work through the night to get this video edited, animated, and exported. Then as always, the video had to be reviewed and approved, which it obviously was because you're watching it, before it was uploaded, and then I celebrated on the roof of our building with my fourth Red Bull of the evening. I was imagining it being sunrise when I wrote this line in the script, so this is a little disappointing, but. Now, if, like us, you think that all of that journalism is worth the effort, then you're likely to be very excited by our new announcement. That's because it was revealed, in variety no less, that we're building a new product with our partners at Nebula called Nebula News. Now, let me explain this exciting announcement. In an increasingly polarized and confusing world, it's hard to find the news that matters and news that you can trust. So every day, the TLDR team is curating a selection of videos that matter most in the world right now, handpicking a feed of content which should help you to keep up to date with everything you need to know. That means no more overwhelming feeds of news coverage, but instead, just the stories that matter most. Videos produced by the brilliant creators on Nebula and curated by the TLDR team. It's truly the easiest way for you to stay on top of the news that matters most, in order to impress at your next wedding, dinner party, or whatever your life entails. It's not just curated news content brought to you directly by us. 
Nebula also features exclusive original content too. That's things like Real Life Law's brand new series, War Room, which every month runs you through a whole load of ongoing conflicts to keep you in the loop. You can also watch every TLDR video on Nebula ad-free, and in many instances, before they land on YouTube. Now, if you've already subscribed to Nebula, then you can find the brand new Nebula news section at nebula.tv forward slash news. And be sure to bookmark or save that link so that you can use it as your TLDRified news homepage. However, if you're not yet a member, then you can click the link in the description to sign up now. If you do, you'll get 40% off an annual plan by using our link. That's less than £2 a month. Plus, when you do, Nebula will know that you came from us, which really helps us out. And as always, thank you so much for your support, especially when we're doing something big and new. And I hope that you really like Nebula News.